Good morning, Bill the Engineer here. Now in my recent video, I took a long hard detailed look at the use of scarf joints for splicing chassis members and I demonstrated after a detailed analysis that they are no stronger than the use of simple square cut butt welded joints. On the other hand, they do involve a great deal more fabrication work and hence I can't recommend their use. But the argument keeps coming back at me, and sometimes in the most unflattering terms about my general stupidity and lack of engineering knowledge, to the effect that since scarf joints have longer weld lengths, more weld metals, they've got to be much stronger, and any old fool can see that. I'm afraid to say it doesn't work like that. And in this video, what I aim to do is I aim to address this very point, show how it does work, and put the subject to bed once and for all. The video is a little bit technical. On the other hand, if you've been through some of my previous videos, I think you'll find it not too hard going. Right, my test case, I've got a plate under tension. It's of width W and thickness T. I've given it a local coordinate system, X and Y, and I've subjected it to an end force FX. And this is distributed uniformly over the end so my longitudinal stress, sigma x, is fx over the area, fx over wt. Now what I want to do is I want to cut it in half and weld it back together again with a weld at an inclined angle. And the proposition is that because the length of the weld is greater than the width of the plate, that it is, in inverted commas, stronger, which means it would transmit a higher force for a given stress level. Now I could take it in an arbitrary angle theta, but if I did that I'd have a lot of trigonometric functions. So I've taken a special case of 45 degrees because we know that both uh, cos 45 and sine 45 are 1 over root 2. But I do assure you that what I'm doing has general applicability. We now need to examine what's happening on the plane of the world. And I start off by drawing a local coordinate system rotated by 45 degrees, x prime and y prime, and I've also plotted more circle for this state of stress. Now, if you know the state of stress on any one plane, more circle enables you to, to calculate the state of stress at any other plane. And we plot the normal stress on the horizontal axis against the shear stress on the vertical axis. Now we note in the x direction we've got a uniform stress of sigma x and also the shear stress is zero. Now the thing about Mohr circle, the angle you measure on the circle is double what you have on the physical specimen. So to show what we have in the y direction, instead of going 90 degrees we actually go around 180 degrees. There's no stress acting across the plate so sigma y is zero and tau y x is zero. But knowing these two points, by simple geometry, we can calculate the stresses on the inclined plane, sigma x prime and tau x prime y prime. And by simple geometry, both of these have the value sigma x divided by 2. I now wish to calculate the forces acting on the plane of the world. Now, if the width of the plate is w, we know that the length of this plane is root 2 times w. If we firstly calculate the forces acting in the y prime direction, it's merely the product of the shear stress, the local shear stress, times the area of this plane. Now from Mohr circle, we know that tau x prime y prime is sigma x over 2. We've actually got a minus sign because it's acting in the negative y direction. And we know the area root 2 times wt so the total force is minus sigma x wt over root 2. And the force acting normal to the plane of the world, um, fx prime, and that's the normal stress times the area. We know again from Mohr circle that the normal stress is sigma x divided by 2 times the area. And this gives us sigma x times wt divided by root 2. I now wish to calculate what the net force is acting across the plane of the world. And we do this by a vector addition. And anyone who did physics at school should remember this. So we draw the vector triangle. 
here we have fy prime, there we have fx prime. And to uh, calculate the force in the horizontal direction, we take the resolved component. And this would be fy prime times cos 45 degrees, which is fy prime divided by root 2. And likewise, the resolved component of this is fx prime times cos 45 degrees, which is fx prime divided by root 2. We know what the value of these forces are because we calculated them here. We put them back in and this gives us the net horizontal force is sigma x times wt, which is merely the force which we applied in the first place. And likewise, the vertical component, fy prime times sine 45 degrees, fx prime times sine 45 degrees, and the vertical force component is zero which again is exactly what we put in. And it cannot be anything else. We can't just manufacture additional forces out of thin air. Equilibrium must be maintained. And the final point I'd like to make, what happens if we aren't at 45 degrees, but we are at some other angle instead? Suppose we have a very acute angle here, maybe 20 degrees, so we end up with a very long weld going across the plate. Well, you go down to Moore's circle, and again, you have to take the commensurate angle, and you find that the stresses acting on the weld, both normal and parallel to the weld, that they are reduced. And the product of the length of the weld times the reduced stresses will end up giving us exactly the same forces which we put in in the first place. It all sums to zero. So am I trying to argue by some sort of trickery that a longer weld can't take any more load than a shorter weld? Of course I'm not, but it does depend how you load it. So if, for example, with this inclined loading, we apply the forces so that they're perpendicular to the weld, then obviously the load carried by the weld will be proportional to the length of the weld. On the other hand, if the axis of loading is horizontal and the weld is oblique to the line of the loading, you can't mobilise this extra strength. And I think that it's here that the misunderstanding creeps in. Well, I hope you followed that technical discussion and that you understood the principal point, which is that although obviously longer welds are stronger than shorter welds, you can only mobilise that strength if the weld lies perpendicular to the line of the loading. If they lie parallel or bleak to the line of the loading, you simply can't mobilise that extra strength. Anyhow, that's my last word on the subject. Bye for now.